Have you seen what's happening in your sanctuary lately? Right now for another episode of Your Sanctuary, a program that highlights what makes our National Marine Sanctuary so special and the people that keep them that way. Welcome to Your Sanctuary. In our first eight episodes, we've explored a variety of topics about marine sanctuaries, the fascinating and amazing habitats and animals, as well as some of the challenges to ocean health and the programs we use to protect these national ocean treasures. But sanctuaries are about more than protecting the marine ecosystems. They are also about protection of our submerged cultural resources and celebrating and exploring our rich maritime history. This is actually a very significant part of the sanctuary mandate. As a matter of fact, the very first National Marine Sanctuary was designated to protect the wreck of the USS Monitor, a Civil War era shipwreck of significant historical relevance to the nation, creating one of the nation's first protected underwater cultural landscapes. Cultural landscapes capture the living past that surrounds us and gives us a better understanding of the links between the natural history and human history of a place. They illustrate how we have shaped the world and how the world's natural environments have shaped us. Perhaps most importantly, cultural landscapes can help provide us with valuable insights into the future, such as the relationship between the health of the ocean and human well-being and prosperity. Many elements make up maritime cultural landscapes. Shipwrecks, lighthouses, abandoned docks, working waterfronts, tribal and indigenous dwellings or sacred places, trawl impacts, lost fishing gear, navigation lanes, and shell mittens are a few of the hundreds of potential human imprints on the maritime landscape. Joining me remotely from Chrissy Field on San Francisco Bay today is Dr. Jim Delgado, the Maritime Heritage Director for NOAA's Office of National Marine Sanctuaries. Jim, tell us about maritime heritage. Maritime heritage is the story of how we, as human beings, have interacted with the oceans. It's the story of how we've done that in the ancient past, and it's the story of how we've done that in the recent past. Maritime heritage is reflected in names that we place on parts of the ocean and on the coast, like Potato Patch Shoal, just outside the gate behind me. It's how that history is reflected in shipwrecks or in a life-saving station that responded to mariners who were in trouble or lighthouses that kept people off of a dangerous shore, or a seacoast fort like Fort Point, again behind me at the gate, that helped keep an enemy from approaching our, our harbor. Maritime heritage is the story of how we've interacted with the ocean in the distant past as humans that lived along the seashore and harvested marine resources. It's the story of how we've interacted in more recent times as immigrants who have sailed across the oceans or who have served in the Navy or the way that members of our families or our ancestors have worked in a maritime industry, fishing or perhaps uh, working in the waterfront. Why is this important to NOAA and to you personally? Why is maritime heritage important? Well, I think it's important because the oceans are important. The oceans cover two-thirds of the planet. And I think if you follow human history, a fair amount of our history has been tied to our relationship with that ocean. It's been the story of how we've harvested from it, and there are mistakes we've made. We've practically fished whales to extinction. It's the story of how we've spread across the world in the oceans, and how that has had profound impacts, not only on each other, but on the environment. It's the story of how through the past, we as human beings have responded to climate change. Just outside this gate, the land once extended 26 miles offshore. The Farallon Islands were coastal mountains. And as a result of the end of the last ice age, that all flooded. And the people that lived there 
had to move progressively to inhabit the shores of a bay that was only formed because it flooded a coastal valley. And the people that lived here, their traditions, 10,000, 18,000 years back, still, they remember that and how they responded to it. So understanding that heritage is absolutely important because if you don't use the past to project forward into the future as we make decisions, then I think we do ourselves a disservice. For me, maritime heritage is important because that history lives, that heritage is there, whether it is a remembered tradition or whether it's something physical like a shipwreck. And when I, as an archeologist, touch a shipwreck, when I respond to it, that history comes to life for me. And it fills me with a desire to share those stories and to connect others to that past. It's powerful, it's important, and it's compelling. And my enthusiasm for maritime heritage hasn't changed at all in the 40 years I've been working at it. How do marine sanctuaries help preserve these amazing stories and the cultural landscapes that connect us? How do sanctuaries preserve this history? Well, they preserve them because these 14 special areas in the ocean reflect part of a larger maritime cultural landscape which defines our country. That maritime cultural landscape, either in an individual sanctuary or in the entire region or in the country, is reflected in the waters and what's beneath the waters in a sanctuary. Here at Gulf of the Farallons, it's traditional fishing grounds. It's paths that mariners have sailed to get in and out of that Golden Gate, which can be treacherous, particularly in the fog. It's shipwrecks of those vessels that didn't quite make it. And it's the various structures in and around in not only this Chrissy Field area, but in San Francisco itself, a city born of the sea and shaped by its trade with the rest of the world, which not only helped build the physical city, but created the dynamic, multicultural, diverse, exciting place that San Francisco is. Sanctuaries don't put fences around these resources or these stories. They set them aside and they protect them for everyone and for future generations in particular. But what they also do is they give us an opportunity as the Office of National Marine Sanctuaries through the Maritime Heritage Program, either at a site or nationally, to study, to survey, to find shipwrecks, to learn these stories and then to share them. Because by sharing them and by reminding everyone, hey, this happened here, or did you know that, or isn't this exciting? I think we not only make history relevant, but we physically connect ourselves to the ocean and to what it has to tell us. So how do you connect people to that heritage? Well, in some ways, you ask them. You sit down with folks like the Coast Miwok or the Kashaya Pomo here in California, or the Ohlone, and you say, Tell me about your stories. Tell me about your traditions. How, how is the ocean important? And they remind you of tales, powerful tales from tens of thousands of years ago of how they were created, how the ocean flooded the world and how few people survived. I mean, they're clearly remembering a time when climate change affected their environment. You talk to people about their family history. Gee, my uncle served in the Navy or my grandfather was a fisherman, or you know, my great grandparents came here to the United States on an ocean steamer that landed in New York, or here in San Francisco, an ocean steamer that came through the Golden Gate from China and landed at Angel Island just across the water. I think the more stories we find, the more stories to share, so much the better, because I think these stories and these connections, they make the ocean relevant in a pretty powerful way. Jim, can you share with us one of the shipwrecks you find most interesting in the San Francisco Bay Area? One of the most interesting shipwrecks. Wow, you know, there are close to 200 ships that have come to grief that sit right in and around this gate or in the waters out there. One of the most powerful, though, is one that's just right there off of that north tower of the bridge. And that's the immigrant steamer city of Rio de Janeiro which on February 22nd, 1901, struck those rocks in a heavy fog coming in from the Far East. It backed off and it sank in a matter of minutes, and 124 people were pulled down into a watery grave. It's the worst maritime disaster to ever strike in or around the Golden Gate, 
But there's more to that story than just that disaster and that loss of life. This is a ship that still sits there 300 feet down in that channel, which is a virtual time capsule of a time when America was reaching out to the Orient, how we in the aftermath of the Spanish-American War had added the Philippines to the country as a territory, how trade with the Far East was very important. It's also the story of how fishermen leaving in the early morning hours were the first to encounter people floating in the water after the city of Rio had sunk and how they stepped up to be the first responders and to rescue those folks that had the good fortune to survive. It's the story of how we ultimately responded to that disaster by building a new life-saving station, today a Coast Guard station, right here on the shores of the bay, because this is a dangerous spot. It might be bright and sunny right now, but try to thread that narrow gap in the fog. Well, the city of Rio de Janeiro didn't make it, as that shipwreck reminds us, and she is one of many that didn't make it. A reminder for us that the ocean is powerful and it's beneficial to us, but it also has to be respected. And I think that's a great lesson for us to remember and a good lesson for sanctuaries to share. The ocean gives, but it also takes. And you need to always be mindful of the importance of the ocean and never turn your back on it. Thanks, Jim. The wealth of shipwrecks found in Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary are a result of the significant maritime exploration and trade which has occurred here, coupled with a coastline dotted with shallow, rocky headlands and largely exposed to fog, prevailing winds and storms. Nearly 400 shipwrecks have been recorded in this region, and there are undoubtedly more. Joining me in the studio today to talk more about cultural landscapes is Tim Thomas, a local fisheries historian and director of Monterey Cannery Row Tours. Welcome to your sanctuary, Tim. Thank you. So what brought people to Monterey Bay? Well, it really was the abundance of the bay out there, but also the abundance of the land that was here. I mean, there was lots of animals, lots of deer and elk and tule elk and even grizzly bear. And of course, uh, the forests were really important to those ships and to those sailors. Yeah, so we know Monterey Bay is, uh, has an abundance of wildlife. And early historical evidence suggests that there was just so much out there. What did these early explorers see? Well, I have accounts from early explorers coming into the Monterey area talking about uh, bird life, particularly in the fall months. So many birds, they said, you couldn't see the surface of the little lakes. Said they could put their hands in the sky and knock birds out of the sky. And they look out into that bay out there and it'd be so filled with seals and sea lions and stellar sea lions and sea otters. They actually thought that the bay was paved. They wrote into their diaries that the Monterey Bay is like a brown cobblestone. In certain times of the year, waves would crash up onto the beach, pouring fish onto the beach. That's how abundant it was out there. I have accounts from early sport fishermen coming into the area in the 1890s, especially in the spring and summer months, talking about salmon runs. So many salmon, they said, that they were actually pushing anchovies onto the beach at Carmel. Wow, that's amazing. I've had people ask me, so how did Monterey get its name? Uh, and I couldn't answer the question, but I bet you can. How did Monterey get its name? Well, Monterey gets its name from a guy named Sebastian Viscaino. Viscaino was on a mission from Spain in 1602 to sail along the California coast to find safe ports for those big galleons that were returning from the Philippines. And he sailed into this harbor in December of 1602. It had to have been, had to have been an absolutely beautiful day. I mean, he would have missed this place altogether. And he was camped up on the hill, uh, what we call Presidio Hill, above the Monterey Wharf. It's been a couple of weeks here. Love this place. And he named it after his sponsor, the Count de Monterey, which I thought was pretty smart on his part, because in those days, you're supposed to name any newly discovered land after a saint, San Diego, right? But no, he named it after a guy that was paying his bills. Uh, he wanted to settle Monterey then, wanted to be named governor. Uh, but Spain had other issues. They had some financial issues. They had some war issues. So they backed off a little bit. In fact, it took them another 170 years to get back here. But I always think about the native people here at that time, the Rumsian people. Uh, I just imagine what it must have been like for them. I mean, to wake up one morning and walk out of your little Thule house and look out onto that bay and see this giant ship out there the size of a whale. I mean, it would be like having a UFO landing in your backyard. I mean, literally, that's what it'd be like for them. But they had this story they used to tell about a whale that swallowed a man. And the story goes, this whale was swimming from Southern California to Monterey. 
when it passed Santa Barbara, it swallowed this man. Well, the whale continued to swim north towards Monterey. As it got close to Monterey, the whale began to feel sick. The closer to Monterey it got, the sicker he got. Finally, the whale comes into Monterey Harbor and is feeling so sick that he spits the man out, man out onto the beach near the Monterey Wharf. Well, as he swallowed that man in Santa Barbara, the man was brown. But when he spits the man out onto the beach in Monterey, the man is white, and that's how white people came to Monterey. But if you think about that story for a minute, you can see, well, you see a ship out there the size of a whale that's spitting out white men in longboats onto your beach. <laughs> Makes perfect sense. It does. So for generations, people have been coming to Monterey for both right. prosperity and enjoyment. Tell us about one of the early businessmen here in Monterey. Well, there are a number of guys that really kind of stand out with me. One of them, a couple of them actually, one of them was, of course, Piaccio Ferrante was an early Sicilian fisherman that came here. And uh, he really is responsible for bringing all of those uh, early Sicilian fishermen here to fish sardine in Monterey. And they came after 1905. Uh, and that, though, in those days, the sardine fishery, by the way, was just a secondary fishery here. Um, so he knows, a good captain like Piatto Ferrante knows, if you take care of your crew, your crew will take care of you, right? So they used to use, I know, they used to use these bottles uh, to float their nets out on the bay out there. And he would use, these bottles have a rounded bottom because if they're, in those days it was upright and has a carbonated beverage in the bottle, it pops the cork. But if it's on its side, it doesn't have that issue. So he'd fill these bottles with beer and they'd use them to float their nets out of the cold water of the Monterey Bay. And then when they're all done fishing, they'll pull off the floats. Everybody had cold beer. That's taking care of your crew. That's right. correct, taking care of your crew. But also the one guy that really stands out to me the most is a guy named... Pop Ernest Dalter, and Pop was a German restaurateur that came to Monterey in 1908 and opened a small restaurant on Alvarado Street called Cafe Ernest. Pop had worked in a number of different restaurants in San Francisco before coming to Monterey. These sort of bohemian style, uh, European style restaurants where folks would go and spend the whole evening in the restaurant. And he also worked from time to time at the Bohemian Club in San Francisco where he got to meet and know a number of these real bohemians like uh, Upton Sinclair and, and George Sterling, these guys who were moving to Monterey around the turn of the last century. Uh, and, well, those guys, when they first came here, those Bohemians, they'd hold these big uh, beach parties at Carmel Beach where they would gather abalone and they would cook the abalone in these pots and big, and on the beach in Carmel. And Pop was fasted with his abalone thing. He couldn't figure out why nobody here in Monterey really was eating it. And so he would bring it into his restaurant and he experimented with it. And he finally came up with this famous recipe where you slice the foot, because that's what you're eating when you're eating abalone as a foot. Pound it to make it nice and soft. And then he would run it through an egg wash, cracker crumbs, and cook it up quickly in olive oil. And soon people came from all over to eat fresh abalone steaks in Pop's restaurant. And they would uh, sing songs and write poetry. Like, Some folks boast the quail on toast because they think it's Tony, but I'm content to owe my rent and live on abalone. George Sterling wrote that poem in his guest book in 1913. So Pop says, there is money to be made here. In 1919, he goes down to the Monterey Wharf and opens the very first restaurant on the Monterey Wharf. Uh, initially, it was called The Club, because it was in the old Monterey Yacht Club. And then quickly, he changed the name to Pop Ernest and became known as the Abalone King. Abalone stew, abalone salad, abalone steaks. In fact, there were two restaurants in the building. There was a lower level that catered to the working class and an upper level that catered to the Hotel Del Monte class. Um, he would serve abalone stew in the abalone shell. He'd fill up the holes of the shell with lead. Um, he had his own abalone dive crew, uh, mostly Japanese, and they would dive abalone for pop. And, and because of pop, and because of that recipe that he developed in 1908, um, by 1920, uh, there were nine full-time abalone companies operating off the Monterey Wharf, all Japanese. Prior to World War II, 80% of the businesses on the Monterey Wharf were Japanese-owned. Fish markets, abalone processors. And in 1929, the abalone industry brought into the state of California almost a million dollars in revenue from abalone. 75% of it right here in Monterey. That's, um, that's amazing. Yeah. Tim, you're making me hungry for abalone. <laughs> now I bet we could tell so many right. more stories, so you've got to come back on the show to tell more stories. Absolutely. In the meantime, if folks want to learn more about uh, Monterey history, and we could get in touch with you. Absolutely. You yeah. can uh, go onto my website. Uh, I do walking tours of Canaro and the waterfront. I do walking tours of, uh, of, of uh, just on abalone itself and, and all kinds of different things. Just go to the website. You can see. What is the website again? It's the Monterey Waterfront CanaroTours.com or they can email me at TimSardine at Yahoo.com. That's great. Thanks again, Tim. Oh, my pleasure. In 18
1896, the small town of Pescadero suddenly blossomed in white after the wreck of the Columbia just offshore. Mysteriously missing cargo from the salvage operation? Numerous barrels of white lead paint. Today I'm at the Sanctuary Exploration Center with Krista Hammond of Santa Cruz Sea Glass. Krista is an amazing artist, author, jewelry maker, ocean advocate, and treasure hunter. Krista, your business is very much tied to glass from the past. Tell me, what exactly is sea glass and how do you come upon it? Sea glass, in essence, is man-made, manufactured glass. Um, and somehow it made its way into the ocean. We're lucky enough here in Monterey Bay to have a couple amazing beaches where we find a lot of sea glass. And I brought some pieces for you to kind of look at. And most of the sea glass we find are old bottles. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that is we actually had some beaches where we used to have dump sites. Back in the early 1900s through to about 1940 or 50, it was regular practice for us to dump our garbage at the beach. Mm -hmm. And what happens over 10, 20, 30, 40 years, the ocean takes all these pieces of glass and rubs them nice and smooth, takes off the sharp edges, which is what you really want to have, and you end up with sea glass. Beautiful. Yeah. Krista, it seems possible that each piece of sea glass would essentially have its own story. How did it get to the beach? How long was it in the ocean? Is there any um, particular intriguing story that you'd like to share with me? Sure. Like I mentioned before, most sea glass that we would find is bottles. And it is a mystery about how it got to the beach. Um, but here in actually Santa Cruz, we are lucky enough to have one beach, and it's really the only beach in the world where we find pieces like this. And when I found my first piece like this, I was blown away. And it actually is the remnants and some discards of a famous glassblower who, uh, for a period of time in the 70s, his pieces accidentally made it into the ocean. And the history and story of these pieces, they do each have a story. And it's amazing that we can actually we trace that back to one man. Gosh, that's so interesting. Now, what exactly inspired you to investigate the stories behind sea glass? Curiosity. I mean, I'm a very curious person, and I just really needed to know where these pieces came from. And not only because we're using them in jewelry, um, which is a big part of our business, but in doing so and in, in investigating this particular beach, I became so enthralled with the history and the story behind it that I decided to write a book about it. And I'm really happy. I have a new book this year uh, called Santa Cruz Sea Glass, The Story Behind the Treasure, and I'm able to tell the absolute story behind this treasure. Krista, your business is part of our ocean economy, and as we know, people come to Santa Cruz from around the world. So how are our visitors and our locals responding to Santa Cruz Sea Glass? Well, it's really been amazing. I feel like it's just been such a gift for my husband and myself. And what really led me to start my business was when we got married. I wanted my wedding ring, which is a piece that my husband and I found in Monterey, to be my wedding ring. And it just meant so much more to me than a diamond. It's just a symbol of our time spent on the beach here in Monterey. And when we started making jewelry, so many people really had that same emotional tie. They love being able to wear sea glass jewelry from us, and it reminds them about the ocean. It reminds them maybe of a vacation here, and the locals really love that as well. So it's been just really a wonderful thing for us to be able to make what I call heritage jewelry, which allows people to pass down these pieces to their daughters or granddaughters mm -hmm. because sea glass is diminishing and there's going to be a day where these pieces that once found in abundance are no longer going to be on the beach, which is a really good thing. It means we're not littering our beaches anymore. So it's been a really great journey. So how can people learn more about sea glass and what you're doing and experience it for themselves firsthand? Well, for five years now, I've been putting on the Santa Cruz Sea Glass and Ocean Art Festival. It's held here at the Coconut Grove on the boardwalk every November. This year it's November 2nd and 3rd, and we are celebrating our fifth year. And it's been such a dream for me to combine sea glass and ocean art, and as well as donating 10% of the admission fees back to the Exploration Center, which is a wonderful thing for me to actually be sitting in this building of which my festival helped build. So it, you can learn all about sea glass 
find amazing artists, coastal art, ocean art, and learn about ocean conservation. So come to the festival. Yeah. And you get your book. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> and my book. Yes, my book is all about one specific beach, which I think people will find very interesting. And I'm donating 10% of the proceeds from that book to the National Marine Sanctuary as well. So it's been a wonderful thing. Well, thank you, Krista. Thank you for being an ocean advocate. And thank you for donating a portion of your proceeds back to the National Marine Sanctuary Foundation. It's my pleasure. I can't pleasure. tell you how much we appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Stanford University's founding president, David Starr Jordan, was responsible for locating Hopkins Marine Station in Monterey Bay in 1892, marking the beginning of the formal study of the Bay's incredible diversity. These days, current events unfold on a dozen channels. Headlines all seem to be shouting. And good news can be as scarce as a moment to relax. So let's turn down the noise this summer, unplug just a little bit, and head to a shelter from the storms of life. The historic port city of Alpena, located on the sunrise shore of Michigan. Only a few hours drive, but miles away from the weight of the world, nestled between a vast forest and an endless clear blue bay, where the wonders of nature are as welcoming as the local hospitality. We can explore more than 200 shipwrecks in the largest freshwater sanctuary anywhere. Count the stairs to the top of a lighthouse or the masts that jut into the harbor sky at moonrise. Let's take a trip to the friendly, picturesque city of Alpena, a haven from the world that's pure Michigan. Your trip begins at michigan.org.